Hi and welcome back. In part two, we're now going to hone in on the thought processes we should be going through before the cards are dealt. Some of this you'll already be doing really well, some of it you're probably doing sloppily, and there may be parts you're not doing at all. This is your opportunity to fix any issues. You're already familiar with Top's App God H. Today we're focusing on the left hand side and expanding upon the questioning drills we began to look at in part one. We'll cover in detail tournament situation, opponents, position and stacks. By the end of this you ought to have absorbed the questioning drills for each element and highlighted any areas you think you can improve on. When you get round to practicing this, you might consider printing out the PDF document with the questioning drills or having it open in front of you whilst you're analyzing a hand or even playing live. If any of you um, never play tournaments and only play cash games, then the first element can just be ignored. But that doesn't mean you should be switched off to situational changes. There are occasionally structural dynamics which change in cash games, such as straddles, which themselves have many different variations. I'm not going to go into those here. In the online game, it's popular to play games where you fold your hand instantly and get a new one at a new table. These are known as Zoom games on PokerStars and by other names on other sites. They have different dynamics as many players overfold pre-flop. In live games, there are sometimes bomb pots played when the dealer changes. These pots are wildly different as every player sees the flop and a huge pot can be won. As time goes by, we're going to see more and more variations of No Limit Hold'em in both tournaments and cash games. So it's up to you to keep on top of how each structural change impacts how you should play. For those of you who already play or want to play other formats of poker with similar betting structure to Hold'em, most of this video series is relevant. The thought processes you need to go through to succeed at those games are almost identical. What's different are the hand strengths, the frequencies and the opponent's mistakes. But the habits you are forming with me are going to give you uh, a really great platform for learning these other games too. Now let's turn our attention to how tournament structure affects each decision. You can see on my tree diagram of questions I'm focusing on the questions highlighted in red. What type of tournament is this and what impact does this have on my approach? For most of you you will be subconsciously aware of the answers to these questions at the beginning of each hand. I challenge you to be more conscious of them by asking yourself these questions before each decision. You don't have to do this forever, just until it becomes routine. I've taught over 500 students and I know that this is a hidden leak for many people, tournament situation can have a huge impact on how we should approach hands, so it's not something to pass over lightly. Practice the drills and you'll be fixing the root cause of many mistakes. 18 years ago when I first started playing, there were already various formats of poker available online and that number has grown drastically. I suspect as some games get closer to becoming solved by machines, other variants will come into being and if you ever become a master of a format you should make hay whilst the sun shines as the evolution of poker is speeding up and the good times may not last long. Some of the formats available today are listed on the screen. Of course there are many many more. SNGs are single table tournaments with a huge amount of ICM involved. If you don't understand ICM, grab a tool such as ICMizer, do some research and practice. The chips you stand to win are worth less, sometimes considerably less, than the chips you stand to lose. That fact changes the standard risk reward ratios. Satellites have their own dynamics. 
Dara Kearney recently released a book devoted to them called Poker Satellite Strategy. If you enjoy playing them, get his book. Tournaments with rebuys and add-ons require some minor adjustments in strategy. There's often much looser play during rebuy periods, so you can get a lot of value from your big hands whilst bluffing will work less often. Timed tournaments are a relatively new thing. In these games, survival has never been more important, and the switch from defense to attack during the last few hands is extreme. Knockout tournaments are growing in popularity. Right now, there's a ton of value in these games, as most players don't understand the value of the bounty, especially in progressive knockouts or PKOs, where the value of the bounty is constantly changing as players are eliminated. If you enjoy bounty tournaments, you ought to see the group coaching session presentation I did with Red Chip Poker. It will really help you hone your skills at that format. Turbos and Hyper Turbos are great for players skilled at short stack poker. They force you to play fast and aggressively with a focus on making your opponents fold. You may have played in six max tournaments. If so, you'll know you have to be more active playing wider ranges. In heads up tournaments, that's even more true. And in heads up tournaments, there's no ICM factor. In fact, any tournament where the winner takes everything, including some satellites, they're completely free of any ICM. So they play out much, much more like cash games. In shootouts, you have to win your table to progress to the next stage. So there's usually no ICM involved in these, at least until the end stages when the prize money kicks in. You should play to win, not to survive. What's important is that you understand the tournament structure you are playing in and you know how it should impact your decision making throughout. I'm a strong advocate for playing the same format over and over again until you know it inside out. I think players who chop and change formats or play multiple formats at the same time online run the risk of confusing themselves. It's best to master one format before moving on to another. Question two on tournaments is, what stage of the tournament are we at? And the follow-up question is, how do I play during this part of the tournament? I have experienced countless hand analysis sessions with students where they follow strong logic through a hand yet completely miss the solution having failed to consider this question. The tournament situation can at times completely dictate our action to the point where we in one spot might be folding 100% or close to 100% of our hands yet in another spot we might be shoving all in with 100% range. The influence of tournament situation cannot be overstated. It will greatly benefit you to ask this question actively rather than allow it to linger in your subconscious, at least until it becomes a habit. If you're unsure how the various stages of a tournament should affect your play, then you have identified a leak in your game that needs fixing. Let me give you a brief overview. During the early stages of a standard MTT when players have large stacks, there's no point taking too many risks. Try and avoid high variance plays such as triple barrel bluffs. You don't want to be playing pots for your entire stack if you can help it. Ideally, you should almost never bust out during the early stages of a tournament. That doesn't mean you can't accumulate chips. If you're really deep stacked, why not see a few cheap flops? Look for any good value situations and extract as much as you can. The mid stages are where the blinds and antis start to become very significant in relation to the average stack size, which could be something between 30 and 50 big blinds. This is where you need to shift into second and third gears and look to build your stack and be more active. It will involve far more risks and you're likely to bust out frequently during the mid stages. You can't always reach the late stages, and expecting it to happen every time is unrealistic. The money bubble is the point at which the prize money kicks in. So if there are 50 places paid and 51 players remaining, you're in the bubble. At this point in the tournament, ICM becomes very intense, 
and your stack size is very significant. If you have a large stack, you can apply pressure on those smaller stacks around you, but if you are a shorter stack, you will usually have to stay patient and pick spots to go all in with premium hands. After the bubble bursts, there are usually desperate short stacks shoving all in in an effort to rebuild their stacks. During the late stages, you need to remain aware of the prize money jumps so you can gauge the ICM pressure as it ebbs and flows. By the time you reach the final table, the pressure will be very significant and stack sizes play a huge role in how aggressively you should play. Make sure you're aware of any special phases of a tournament, such as rebuy periods or money bubbles. They can have a significant impact on your strategy. The third question here forces you to think about the payout structure of the tournament. Often, I will spend a lot of time studying the precise payout structure so it's clear in my mind. I think this is something players don't do enough of. If you're entering the same structure of tournament time and time again, you don't need to worry as much about this. But it's particularly important if it's a new game or if the structure is complicated. Here are a few examples of games with different payout structures. A standard MTT usually rewards around 10, 15% of the player pool with most of the money up top. That means ICM pressure is minimal to start with, but gets very intense around the money bubble and during the final table. Then it evaporates when the action goes heads up. A standard SNG rewards 33% of the player pool usually with 50% to the winner, 30% to second, and 20% to third, if it's a, a nine person game. This means that ICM is incredibly intense right from the very beginning. The chips you stand to win are worth far less than the chips you stand to lose. Once again, the ICM factor intensifies towards the bubble and evaporates when the action goes heads up. Any winner-takes-all tournament is free of ICM. They should play out much more like cash games. The chips you win are worth exactly the same as the chips you lose. Any game where the game ends without one player winning all the chips requires a drastically different strategy to traditional tournaments. The emphasis is on survival, not on winning. 50-50 games are a great example of this. The aim is not to accumulate chips, but simply to survive until only half the field remains. In these games, ICM is at its most intense. Bounty tournaments have two independent prize pools. The value of the bounty in standard knockout tournaments is simple to work out, but the mistake most players make is not converting the cash value of the bounty into tournament chips. These bounties can be very valuable, and the most common mistake players make is doing too much folding. In progressive knockouts, the value of the bounty is constantly changing and it's not easy to work out. This leads to mistakes being made by players overvaluing or undervaluing the bounty prizes. If there are dual prize pools, you need to spend some time studying how this impacts your strategy. Finally, keep your eye out for new formats with new pay structures. Devote enough time to understanding the structure of the tournament and have a clear grasp of how this impacts your strategy. I've talked a lot already about ICM implications and if you're asking the first three questions properly, this fourth question should already be answered. That said, I think it does deserve a question to itself as ultimately this is the one thing which differentiates tournaments from cash games. For a lot of you, you will combine this with stack sizes and I encourage you to reorder these questions if it suits you to do so. I think the most important thing is to have a general feel for how much ICM pressure you yourself are under going into the hand. If you can also gauge the pressure on your opponents, that's a bonus. We have a finite amount of time to process all this information before the cards are dealt, so do what you can in the time available. If we're studying this off the table, we can follow this four-step process to improve our understanding of how ICM affects preflop ranges, especially in shorter stacked spots. 
And when I say practice this off the table, that doesn't mean you can't bring that knowledge to a game situation. If I have enough time, I'll try to predict how my optimal shoving or reshoving ranges are impacted by ICM even before the cards are dealt. It's all about thinking one move ahead. So step one is identifying the pressure on each opponent, which is mainly about studying their stack sizes. Step two is considering how that ICM pressure ought to impact their optimal strategy, whether they're raising, shoving, or perhaps calling a shove. Step three is to assess what mistakes they are likely to make. So will they do too much raising, too much folding, whatever it is. The final step, which is best done using an ICM range tool, such as ICMizer or HRC, is to revise our own ranges based on the adjusted ranges we put our opponents on. I know this is a crazy amount of analysis to go into considering the cards haven't even been dealt, but I want to encourage you to predict what's about to happen next. This might be something you do for just one opponent who happens to be sat immediately to your right with eight big blinds, you might be considering in advance what his likely shoving range should be and what range you can choose for calling. Now let's focus on the four questions about our opponents, starting with how many of them there are. You should know how your preflop ranges alter as the table gets shorter handed, and this is true for all formats except perhaps heads up games. If you don't know how the dynamics change with fewer opponents, that's a leak that needs fixing. The fewer players there are on the table, the more often you are on the blinds and the more necessary it is to be active. Typical ranges get exponentially wider as the action gets shorter handed. When ranges get wider, there's lots of byproducts. One of them is that weaker hands turn up at showdowns more often. The second question is aimed at the entire table rather than at individuals. So we're trying to get a feel for how tight or loose the table is and how aggressive or passive it is. You can spend time focusing on individual opponents, but I'd recommend keeping your thoughts broad at this point. If you're playing online, you can scan the table statistics for this information, or you can look at each player's VPIP and PFR in turn. This should give you the information you need. There may be other statistics you look at too, such as aggression, but don't go into too much detail at this point. Here's a simple presentation of the four broad playing styles. Try and fit each opponent into one of the boxes and you'll have a useful idea of how the table as a whole is playing. This is intentionally crude. Remember, we don't have time for too much detail just yet. Now, if you have time, you can consider specific opponent weaknesses or just anything else of relevance. Is someone tilting? Is someone in a bad mood? Does someone fall to three bets way too often? Has the old guy played one hand in the last 50? Now's your chance to make any specific observations that might help you in the next hand. Some of the questions in the questioning drills may not appeal to you. There is flexibility to add in questions of your own or change things round. Definitely translate them if English is not your first language. Here are a few other questions I find useful when thinking about my opponents. If you know an opponent does a lot of calling or folding, it can really help you exploit their weaknesses. The final question I recommend asking about our opponents before the cards are dealt is what are their levels of thinking? This is another question which gets us nicely prepared for the action. Frequently I analyze hands with students and they come up with elaborate and skillful solutions, yet often those solutions are completely inappropriate against opponents who are barely even thinking. To nip this problem in the bud, we need to try and assess their levels of thinking in advance micro images I'll talk about on the next slide. Here are the levels of thinking. If this is new to you, it's really useful to understand what type of thoughts your opponents are having. 
there are plenty of fishy players on level 0 or level 1. Against these players, you should keep your poker as simple as possible. For those on higher levels of thinking, you'll want to try and stay one step ahead of them, but just one step. For advanced opponents, you'll want to try and understand how they are viewing the table. How do they view their own images and your image? Is this influencing their play? A micro image is a short term image, which is what might be perceived from the past half hour or so of play. This can differ from the real profile of a player, but it's good to be aware of both your own micro image and those of other thinking opponents. For example, a solid loose aggressive player might have a quiet hour and is then able to leverage this tighter image when he starts playing looser again. His bluffs are more believable. If you're able to pick up on this type of information, it can help you be more accurate with your reading of situations. Your own micro image will influence how your opponents view you. If you've been particularly loose, your opponents might expect you to have a loose range, so use this information to stay ahead of them. In this situation, it might make sense to stick to tighter, value heavy ranges until your image changes again. Switching styles mid game is an advanced skill and not always necessary, but keep it in mind when your micro image shifts in one direction. Micro images are more important when you play against opponents you don't know well. If you only ever play poker against the same opponents, everyone knows everyone's style, so there's no point worrying about micro images. Next, I want to discuss position. Before the cards are dealt, you should know where you are sat and what your standard opening range is. This should be ingrained in your mind. You can also ask how this particular spot is different and how your opening range might change. For example, if you have a bunch of rocks sat behind you, you might decide to steal with a wider range, or if the blinds are three betting machines, you might tighten your range. What we're doing here is anticipating our next move. It, it won't always work out. Someone could throw a spanner in the works by raising in front of us, and we'll need to go back to the drawing board. But if the action falls round to us, we'll be well prepared to make our decision. We will already have considered our range for raising. If you're sat on one of the blinds, you might consider how you'll react to a raise. Again, you should be aware of your default ranges for flat calling or three betting, but how might they differ in a situation that you're facing right now? Against a bunch of calling stations, I would not bother polarizing my three bet ranges. I'd stick to a lot of value hands but against well-balanced opponents, polarizing will be useful. It's worth noting the positions of your opponents. This doesn't need to take long, but you know it's worth doing. It's not essential. Start by focusing on the player sat next to you. In tournaments, note where the chip leader is sat and any short stacks. The player sat to your immediate right, you will have position on most of the time. Ideally, he will be a loose fish and you will be ideally positioned to exploit him. On your left, you would prefer a tight player so you can get away with stealing more often. In cash games, it can sometimes be a good idea to get up and find another table if the conditions don't suit you. At any rate, you should pay attention to the two players right next to you. The issue of stack sizes is far more important for tournament players than cash game players. But either way, it shouldn't be ignored. You should know how deep you are at the start of every hand. What is my stack size in big blinds? It's a question you must be able to answer. The two subsequent questions are, how does this impact my play? And can I manipulate the SBR to my liking? We'll talk about both of these things on the next slide. Here are five categories of stack depth. At the very least, you should know how you are going to play in each stage. Deep stacked in both cash games and tournaments, suited, connected hands have more value, whereas the shorter you get, having a high card becomes more important. The push fold game must be learned. Knowing your stack depth pre-flop can also help you predict what kind of stack to pot ratio is likely on a flop. In both cash games and tournaments, learning to manipulate situations to create desirable SPRs is part of learning the geometry of pots. For example, 
There are certain hand types such as big pairs where I'll try and avoid SPRs of 5 through to 8, preferring either a smaller SPR or a larger one. Why? Because you can normally just commit to an overpair on a small SPR flop and you're rarely going to risk all of your chips when the SPR is large. But medium ones pose a problem. So to give you an example, if I have a starting stack of 40 big blinds, I know a standard 3x raise will likely put me in danger of creating an SPR of about 6. So I'll opt for a larger sizing. Fully understanding stack depth at the very beginning of the hand can help you stay in control of a pot. SPR manipulation does not always go according to plan and it is advanced. So if you're confused by it, take a note, come back to it later. It's not our focus right now. But I will talk about pot geometry in more detail during the post flop videos. Now cash game players won't need to worry about these final questions about stack size. These are tournament related and can also be considered at the same time as tournament situation. After considering your own stack size, you should turn your attention to the stack sizes of each opponent, noting in particular any short stacks or the chip leader. You should be formulating ideas about which stacks you would like to attack and which you would prefer to avoid. Remember that in ICM intense spots, medium sized stacks can be the best targets. It's a common mistake that players will always target the short stacks, but those stacks are far more likely to fight back as they have less equity in the prize pool than the medium stacks. Note the position and stack sizes of any players who have more chips than you. You should be less inclined to enter pots against those opponents. If you're playing in an MTT, be conscious of the average stack in the tournament. Depending on the event, this might be displayed for you on a big screen, otherwise don't be afraid of stretching your legs and checking out the stack sizes on the other tables. If you notice your stack is dropping well below the level of the average stack, it's time to go up a gear. You might look for spots to 4-bet shove, 3-bet shove or squeeze. It's usually smarter to get busy before you get down to less than 12 big blinds, when opponents are more likely to just call your shoves with wide ranges. Play aggressively whilst you still have fold equity. Here's a summary of some of the things we've just discussed. First, by knowing the stack sizes of all the opponents before the cards are dealt, as the action starts, you'll know which stack is the effective one. One of the biggest leaks I notice in students' thought processes is not knowing the effective stack size. It's vital information, especially for tournament players. Practice doing a scan of all the stacks on your table before every hand. Online players have very little time, but the information is displayed. Live players have more time, but have to make smart estimates. They need to get good at counting stacks, which takes practice. Second, take note of which stacks you can apply pressure to. Third, take note of which stacks you would prefer not to engage. And finally, keep a track on the average stack in a tournament. Related to stack sizes are the blinds and antes. You must pay close attention to the format of the tournament. You, you can do this before it starts, but during the action, you'll need to keep an eye on how long remains for each blind level. A 24 big blind stack can suddenly be a 12 big blind stack the next hand. If you're anticipating the changes in blinds and antes, you'll be able to make small adjustments in strategy. Stay one move ahead. You can see just how much there is to consider before the cards are even dealt. It's an overwhelming amount of information to process, especially for tournament players. Some of you may be thinking it's unrealistic to do all of this before each hand. You'd be amazed how quickly the two brain hemispheres can process information once the pathways are fused. It's your job to ensure those pathways are well trodden. That's just practice. I'll see you in video three.